Okay, so basically we are going to just talk through Milgram study in this little video. So what I want you to be doing is filling in the course studies booklet that you've got. Um, so if you go to page 29, that's where you'll find Milgram. So I'm just going to talk through, this is on a video so that you can pause it and fill the booklet in as you go along, uh, watch it at your own pace, but I'm just going to talk you through the study. Okay, so um, it's a uh, Milgram study done in 1963. Uh, and it's a behavioural study of obedience. Okay, so the key theme here is responses to people in authority. And this is the classic study of the social area. Okay. So, uh, in terms of the background, so we're filling in this background box, the first box you've got there. Um, from 1933 to 1945, uh, as I'm sure you remember from your history lessons, uh, millions of innocent people were systematically slaughtered on command. So there was these completely inhumane actions and they have originated in the mind of, of one person, uh, but they could have been carried out on this massive scale because so many people obeyed his orders and conformed to his ideas. So history and observation suggest that for many people, obedience is such an ingrained behaviour that it will override any training in ethics, any empathy you've got or any moral values that you show. So when you're given an extreme command, the idea is that if that comes from a person who is a legitimate authority figure, so um, somebody in a position of, of power over you, in other words, um, subordinates, so in other words, people who are not in the position of power, who the people who that authority figure has power over, will adopt something known as an agentic state. Now, this is something that we're going to look at in your lesson, uh, but that means that they become the instrument for carrying out another person's wishes. Okay, so adoption for this agentic state can account for such horrific acts that are committed in the name of obedience so in other words things like world war ii um atrocities in rwanda and all this kind of stuff could be explained by people adopting this agentic state they're not doing these things because they want to do them but they're doing it because they've been told to and they're acting as an agent of somebody else's will okay so milgram uh, aimed to investigate the process of obedience by testing how far an individual would go in obeying an authority figure. So he administered electric shocks to another person. Um, uh, well, this is what he said they were doing, administering these electric shocks to another person, uh, even when the command breaches moral co code and then the individual um, will demonstrate whether they would break this moral code to hurt another person against their will or not. Okay, so pop this slide down into the aim box there. Okay. Now, you may see that if you use online resources, things like Psych Yogi and all this kind of stuff, I don't really advise using those because they can get a few details wrong. So an example of that is um, a lot of places refer to this study as an experiment. Even Milgram himself in his own paper referred to this as an experiment. But it's not technically an experiment. It's technically a controlled observation. Okay, So where you've got research method in your booklets, circle uh, observation and make sure that you write it is a controlled observation. Okay, So it's a controlled observation as there is no manipulation of an independent variable. So for something to be an experiment, there needs to be a manipulation of an independent variable. Either the researcher needs to manipulate it or it's manipulated in a natural sense, so by having a disorder or not having a disorder. In this case, there is no independent variable. Therefore, it must be an observation. Okay. Now, it's controlled because the study took place in a lab. So it happened at Yale University, um, and it was done there so that conditions could be controlled, so they could control for who took up what position in the study, so who was a teacher, who was a learner, uh, they could standardise things, they could make it highly controlled. So there was um, a high level of standardisation and control, so there was standardised responses, experimenters, prods, um, so yeah, it was, it was very highly controlled. Okay. So, data was gathered uh, through observations made by 
both an experimenter who was in the same room as the participant and other experimenters who observed this whole process through a one-way mirror. So a one-way mirror is where they can see into the room, but you can't see behind the mirror, so you can't see whether there's anyone there or not. Uh, most of these sessions were also recorded on a magnetic tape. Uh, sometimes photographs were taken through the one-way mirror and uh, notes were made on the unusual behaviours as well. Okay, so there was a lot of note-taking, a lot of recordings of the different behaviours that we saw here. Okay. All right, so to fill in the sample details, so there was 40 male participants and they were all aged between 20 and 50 years. They were all from the New Haven area of America uh, and they were from a wide range of occupations. So there was postal clerks, people who worked for the postal service, high school teachers, salesmen, engineers. Uh, there was lots of different ranges of occupations. However, the only thing that there wasn't was students. So Milgram excluded students altogether because he believed that there was something that's fundamentally different about students when it comes to obedience. It might be that they're more likely to obey because they're so used to being subordinates to authority. They're so used to having like teachers and lecturers telling them how to behave and what to do and that they have to obey. They don't really get a choice. Okay. All right, so in, in terms of recruiting the sample, it was a volunteer sample or a self-selected sample in other words uh, and they were obtained through posting a newspaper advert so you can see the newspaper advert right there um, and also through direct mail solicitation so that is putting leaflets through people's doors basically so it asked for volunteers to participate in a study of memory and learning Okay, so remember that that is what they were asked to take part in because that will crop up when we come to evaluate the study. They were asked to take part in a study of memory and of learning. Okay. Um, and they knew it was going to be at Yale University and the advert said that they would be paid $4.50. Okay, so uh, it was $4 for actually just showing up at the lab and then there was 50 cents that they also paid for car fare, for travel to get there. Um, now, $4.50 doesn't sound like a large amount of money, uh, but remember this was 1963, so money was worth a lot more then, so I think that's worth probably about $35 now. Okay. Um, okay, so moving on to the procedure. Okay, so the first thing that they did was prior to the study, so before it all began, 14 Yale seniors, so these were students, uh, were all psychology majors. They were all provided with a detailed description of the experimental situation, so of Milgram's research proposal. They were asked to reflect carefully on it and asked to predict the behaviour of 100 hypothetical Americans of diverse occupations who ranged in age from 20 to 50 years. So in other words, they said, we're going to conduct this piece of research Say we get 100 participants, they're going to be of diverse occupations, so all different occupations, they're going to be different ages, between 20 and 50. How many of those 100 participants do you think would agree to take part, would, would not agree to take part, would agree to um, commit an immoral act, basically, would obey the authority figure? Okay, so that's the first thing that they did. Okay, so as this uh, was a observation and not an experiment, there was no control group, there was just an experimental group. Okay, so the 40 participants in the experimental group were always given the role of teacher. So they were always going to be somebody who was supposed to be teaching a list of words to a learner, because remember they said it was a, an experiment about memory and learning. Um, so they were always given the role of teacher, but this was made to appear random. So they got the learner and the teacher into the same room and they gave them a fixed lottery. So the person who uh, was going to be the teacher, who was the real participant, would go to pick straws, but the straws were fixed so that they would always end up picking the role of teacher. Okay, uh, And then the other person who was in there was a learner. Now this learner is a confederate. 
So a confederate means that they are a person who is taking part in the study, but they're a stooge. So they know the aims of the study, they know what you're planning to find, they know what's going to happen. So they're like an actor that comes to take part in your research. So this learner, who is the confederate, was strapped into a chair with electrodes attached to his arms. Um, now, obviously, the confederate and the experimenters knew that these were non-active electrodes, but the teacher didn't. They, they thought they were real. Okay, so the learner, uh, or the confederate, he was known as Mr Wallace, and he reported that he had a heart condition. So the teachers knew that he had a heart condition. Okay, uh, and then Jack Williams uh, was the experimenter, so he appeared as the authority figure. He was wearing a white lab coat and he sat in the room at all times. Uh, the participants um, were shown a trial shock of 45 volts to uh, simulate genuineness. So in other words, it was given to show that the learner would react to it to try and make them believe that it was a real shock. Okay. So we've got a few more slides on procedure. So um, the teacher sat in front of an electric shock generator in an adjacent room to the learner. So this is kind of how it would look. So you can see the bit that's blue is where the experimenter and the teacher are sat. So obviously you've got the experimenter here. So this would be uh, the person sat in the white lab coat, giving the instructions, acting as the figure of authority. And this is the teacher. So this would be the participant, one of those 40 males who was recruited to take part. And this here is your learner. So this is the confederate. So you can see that the teacher has got this electric shock machine, which they appear to find is wired up to the learner. However, this is a solid wall, so they can no longer see the learner. Okay. So um, the teacher sat in front of this electric shock generator in an adjacent room. He had to conduct a paired words test on the learner and giving him an electric shock of increasing intensity for every wrong answer. So they gave them lists of pairs of words, so it might be like blue sky, green grass, red balloon, and then later on they were tested on it, so they'd be given one of the words, so they'd say blue, and they'd have to say the other word. If they got it wrong, they were supposed to give them an electric shock, and for every answer that they got wrong, the electric shock was supposed to increase a voltage, okay, or a voltage point. So the teacher was told that these electric shocks that they were giving would be painful, but they would not be harmful. Okay, so um, the machine that they used, so the electric shock machine, it had 30 switches uh, and the voltage on this ranged from 15 volts to 450 volts and it increased at 15 volt increments. Okay, now despite the fact that they were told that they would be painful but not harmful, you can see down here that there were lots of different labels given to groups of four switches okay so it starts at 15 and it goes up to 60 here and you can see that that is labeled as a slight shock a mild shock from 75 up to 120 is a moderate to a strong a very strong intense extreme intensity and then you can see here from 375 onwards it's marked as danger severe shock and then the last couple of increments, so 435 and 450, are marked as triple X, which would be a lethal dose. Now, I don't know if you know, but the shock that you get out of a plug socket, it's still quite enough to give you a severe shock, and that is only 270, shock, 270 volts. So that's down here. Okay, so you can imagine that the top end of the scale would be deadly. Okay. Alright, so as well as um, being told that they were real, being given the trial shock, this machine also made like electric sounds to increase the realism, to make it seem real. Okay. So remember, this machine wasn't real, but in order to make it seem real, the learner, so this is the confederate, the actor, they produced a set of predetermined responses and these were recorded 
Okay, so they weren't doing it at the time. So again, it's standardised. Again, it was kept the same for every participant. They recorded their responses to the test. So they gave approximately three wrong answers to every correct one. So when they were being given, uh, you know, blue, what's the word that matches with that? They would get one right, but then they would get three wrong. Okay, so they would be giving these electric shocks every time they got one wrong, increase it by an increment every time they got one wrong. And at 300 volts, the learner would pound on the wall and after that would make no responses whatsoever, no replies at all. Okay. So at this point, what we saw was that some of the teachers, so some of the actual participants, would turn to the experimenter for advice on whether to proceed or not. Um, so bear in mind that earlier on, when they were asked to take part and given the $4.50, they were told that they would get this for just showing up at the lab. It wasn't relying on them staying for the whole time, so they had the right to withdraw. But at this point, when they turned to the experimenter, the man in the white lab coat, your figure of authority for advice on whether to proceed, the experimenter would respond with a series of standardised prods. So you need to know these four prods and they would happen in this order. So if they heard that pounding and then they didn't know whether to continue or not, they would turn to the experimenter and, you know, say, is he OK? Do, do I continue? What do I do? And the researcher would say either, please continue, or please go on. Okay, if the teacher protested for a second time, the researcher would say, or the experimenter would say, the experiment requires that you continue. If they protested a third time, they would say, it is absolutely essential that you continue. And if they protested a fourth time, they would say, you have no other choice, you must go on. Okay, so you can see that this kind of might feel like they're removing the right to withdraw there a little bit. Okay, now the study finished when either the teacher refused to continue, so they were disobedient, they went through the series of four prods and said, no, I'm, I'm not doing it, I'm not going to carry on, or when they reached the 450 volts and was obedient. So when they reached the top end of the scale, there was no voltage increments left. Then the participants were fully debriefed at the end, they were told the true aims, they even got the researcher to come out and um, give them all these details, they got the learner to come out to show that they were unharmed, to show that they were okay. So they were fully debriefed afterwards, but imagine how you would feel thinking that you just killed somebody and then they're like, oh no, he's alive, he's okay, don't worry about it. Okay, so think about the ethics of that. All right, so we'll move on to the findings. So they collected some quantitative findings. So there was a considerable, there was a considerable agreement between the 14 Yale seniors on the expected behaviour of hypothetical subjects. So in other words, when they were asking these Yale seniors, if we had 100 people, do you believe that they would be obedient and shock somebody up to a lethal voltage, they all agreed that only an insignificant minority would go through to the end of the shock series. So only an insignificant minority would shock up to 450 volts. So estimates ranged from 0 to 3% and the mean estimate of the percentage of people who would obey was 1.2%. Okay, however, what we found in this study is that 40 participants saw 100% of people shocked up to 300 volts because remember at this point they started banging on the wall so 100% of participants shocked up to that and then 26 participants, so 65% of people then continued to shock up to 450 volts up to the lethal dosage so only 14 participants were actually disobedient and stopped at some point after 300 volts Okay, so those are your general figures that you need to know. But here's the breakdown of the, the break-off points, so when people dropped out. Okay, so at 300 volts, when he pounded on the wall, at that point, five participants dropped out. So five participants said, I, I don't agree to shock him anymore, and withdrew 
from that. They were disobedient. Okay? At 315, four more did the same thing. They were disobedient, they disobeyed. 332 more, and then one for each increment afterwards until 26 participants remained and shocked up to the full voltage. Okay? They also got some qualitative data. So remember, they were recording videos, they were recording things about the participants, making notes on them, taking photographs. And one thing that they found was that when taking part, so when administering the shocks, many of the participants showed extreme stress. So there was signs such as sweating, trembling, stuttering, laughing nervously, and three of the participants had uncontrollable seizures from the stress of what they thought they were doing to these participants. When the study was completed, um, those participants who'd been obedient were seen to breathe heavy sighs of relief, they mopped their brows, they were nervously fumbling for cigarettes, some of them shook their head, um, which appeared to be in regret, and some of them remained calm throughout. Okay. Now, when Milgram looked at the responses to this, he came up with 13 possible explanations for the high levels of obedience. So for 13 possible explanations of why people were so obedient to this authority figure when it was completely immoral to be that way. So it's not what Milgram expected. Milgram expected that you would find that only, remember, about 1.2% of people would obey. There would be a small minority. And so he had to come up with some explanations. So the first thing he said was, it could be the prestigious setting. So it's Yale University. It's very credible as a university. You would assume that the research conducting the research is competent, that they wouldn't ask you to do anything immoral, that they had integrity. Um, and they wouldn't allow a person to die as part of their experiments because then that would impact negatively on this prestigious setting and they just wouldn't let them do that. Okay, so that was the first explanation they gave. Um, he also said that the participants were told the shocks were not harmful, um, which they were, but you have to question whether they really truly believe that or whether they just hoped that they weren't harmful because remember they had all those stickers saying high voltage XXX on there so you, you know that's that's a bit dodgy really isn't it that they would believe that they're not harmful you have to think that they were just hoping it wasn't um, and the third one that you need to know really is that the situation was completely new for the participants that they had no past experience of how to guide their behavior so sometimes when you're in a situation where you think oh, I'm not going to do that again because it it had a negative outcome last time or I did something that was immoral once before and I'm not doing that again, you know, I'll be honest next time. Nobody had been in a situation like this before where they were being required to electrocute somebody to a, to a lethal voltage and so they had no idea of how to behave. Okay. All right, so your general conclusions. So Milgram concluded that inhumane acts can be done by ordinary people. Okay, so it was a shock finding. They didn't expect to find this, but they found that 60% of those normal people, ordinary people, completed inhumane, immoral acts. Now, they said that this was because people will appear to obey others who they consider to be a legitimate authority figure even if what they're being asked to do goes against their moral beliefs. Okay. They also thought that people might obey because they have got these certain situational factors that lead them to suspend their sense of autonomy and become an agent of an authority figure. So that links with this agent agentic state. So the situational figures, so the pressure of somebody in authority, um, gets them to suspend their sense of autonomy, so suspend their sort of their free will, their independence, and become an agent of somebody else's will. 
and also that there are individual differences, such as personality, that influenced the extent to which people will be obedient. So some people did drop out at 300 volts. They did become disobedient. Okay. All right, so that's the main thing about the study. So make sure you've got all these notes in there. Go back over the video if you need to, because I want to see that all of these boxes are filled in. And we are going to evaluate this study when I see you in lesson.